This Week in Virology, episode number 135, recorded on May 23rd, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. We're back today live from the annual meeting of the American Society for Microbiology in New Orleans, Louisiana. And we're going to have some of the individuals who are participating at this meeting talking with us today about viruses. My guests from my left is an assistant professor in the pediatric section of adolescent medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine, Rachel Katzenellenbogen. Welcome. Thank you. The, one of the few people in the world that has a name longer than mine. <laughs> More letters than mine, rack and yellow. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, on my left also, a distinguished professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Pittsburgh, Roger Hendricks. Welcome as well. Thank you. And on my right, uh, an associate member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and also a professor at the University of Washington, Harmit Malik. Welcome. Hello, Vince. How are you doing? Well, I want to thank all of you for coming and joining today. We're going to talk about the things that these individuals do. And I want to remind anyone in the audience who can ask a question of us, we'll pass a mic to you. And also, we have some online viewers, and they're welcome to submit questions as well uh, via the chat or Twitter. So do listen up and, and ask us what we don't explain properly. Uh, before we start talking about what you have done, you've, been, you've all been at the meeting for a bit. Have you seen any particularly good sessions that you want to just note? I saw a session, well, actually, I thought that the opening um, mm -hmm. speakers uh, the first evening were fascinating as right. someone who does not do bacteria work, just thinking about how, you know, beyond the virus-host interaction at the cell, but bacteria interacting with a whole organism and how it really affects how each works together is just yeah. fascinating. We had one of the speakers, Nicole Dubillier on TWIM yesterday here to talk about the symbionts and these tubular worms that live at the bottom of the ocean. It's great. You also participated in a session about HeLa cells. I did, today. yeah. And that involved um, explaining the origin of them and the science behind it, basically? It was, it was. And I think that it was based on, um, the impetus of the session was based on the best-selling um, book, mm. uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Right. Um, and there have been people who've really been a, a champion in, in recognizing the huge comp contributions that the HeLa cells that came from Henrietta Lacks have had in science in general and cancer biology and virology, um, and putting all of that in the context of understanding HPV disease and clinical diseases associated with that, and then just uh, the broader context of minorities participating in clinical trials, um, and then who really takes ownership of human subjects' um, consent and then human tissue consent once it's sure. not in you anymore. Right. It's changed a lot since the 1950s, yeah. obviously. How about you, Roger? Seen any good sessions? Yeah, well, I guess I've, I've seen several. But uh, <laughs> one that I particularly liked was first day on new ways of seeing things. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, sort of a potpourri of, of uh, different advances in technology that let you see deeper into cells, things like cryo-electron microscopy, which has come a long ways recently, and uh, new ways to use mass spectrometry yeah. to, and uh, uh, fluorescent probes and things like that's that. That's a session that, that cuts across disciplines, right? Yeah. You do. So that's good. It's always a nice kind of session to have. Are you, are you chairing a session, or you've already chaired I, one? I chaired a session yesterday uh, on the diversity of phages and their influence on the evolution of, of microbes. Oh, great. But you seen any good science here? Actually, I was going to point to a talk that I heard in Roger's session, which was the good. first talk about uh, uh, phage infecting pleurococcus, which is a fascinating talk about uh, pathogenicity islands that are essentially not even alignable across very closely related species, which are essentially hotspots of turnover. They're essentially phage susceptibility determinants that are being rapidly turned over. So even though we have sort of grown up with the viewpoint now that there is so many pleurococcus in the ocean, uh, it turns out that they're actually quite distinct in terms of their phage susceptibility. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not such easy pickings for these phage because they have to find the right match and then essentially propagate an infection before the bacteria switches over. Mm -hmm. So it's almost a grand scheme meta 
antigen specificity switch in action Neat. on a nice. planetary scale. Well, I went to the Hilleman lecture yesterday, which uh, is awarded to a different individual every year. This year it was Albert Kapikian, the discoverer of some very important viruses, norovirus and rotavirus. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it, so Harry Greenberg gave the talk instead, and Harry did a great job giving the history of, uh, of the discovery of these viruses. And it's always interesting to go back a long way and see how things were done. It's very different from today. So let's talk about uh, some of your work, and we'll start with, with Rachel, because you have to leave by three. Mm -hmm. And we know that you're interested in human papillomaviruses. We have had very recently a session on TWIV with Michelle Osborn, mm -hmm. so we so know some of the basic uh, biology, although I've learned over the years it's never a bad thing to repeat things. Even for me and for all the students we teach, no one seems to mind. So let's start at the beginning and talk about the diversity of, of HPVs and what they do in people. Well, so, so there's human papillomaviruses, and then there are other right. papillomaviruses that infect other species. So, but just thinking about human papillomavirus itself, there are more than 100, probably more than 150 genotypes that have been found. And they are based on their, their genotype as opposed to serotype. So they're based on their DNA sequences broken down into genuses and then um, subfamilies from that point on. Um, and the alpha genus of human papillomavirus is what typically infects the mucosa as opposed to keratinized skin. Mm -hmm. Um, and the alpha genus of human papillomaviruses are further broken down into low-risk categories or high-risk categories based on their association with cancer. And that initially was cervical cancer, but there are many other cancers that high-risk HPVs are also associated with. So many of the serotypes infect your skin and cause warts, superficial warts. Mm -hmm. And some, I understand, don't cause any symptoms at all? Clinical disease at all, yeah. So in this audience, is everyone seropositive for some? HPV? Probably everyone's seropositive for HPV type 1, which causes mm -hmm. plantar warts, or okay. even if you didn't know it, you had it. Um, and, but then thinking about the alpha genuses, um, HPV, even looking at antibody status or prior sort of mm -hmm. DNA or RNA, um, historically, if you look at teens to middle-aged adults, about 75% of us have evidence of a prior infection. And I think with even better um, PCR sampling, we were able to find HPV DNA. The, the vast, vast majority of us have uh, an HPV type from a, a genitally infected uh, So there is a HPV. subset that in, is sexually transmitted. How many serotypes, roughly? So the alpha genus is, right. t is the main ones that are, are sexually transmitted and are, and are in the mucosa. So you can find them in the genital tract, um, often at the anal verge, mm -hmm. and in the oral um, cavity as well. But not all of them are high risk. Right? Not all of them are high risk, and, that's right. And by high risk, we mean associated with cancers. Right. Right, and mm -hmm. which, which ones are those? Um, so the alpha-9 species of the alpha mm -hmm. genus is, is typically a part of it. The two numbers of genotypes that are most commonly associated with cervical cancer are HPV 16 and 18. 16 is associated with about 50% of cervical cancers worldwide, and 18 is about 20%. Okay, so, and now, uh, so if you are infected with one of these high-risk serotypes, what is the rough likelihood that it will progress to a cancer? So it's very unlikely that it will progress to a cancer. You know, most of us have <clears throat> an infection with HPV at some point in our life. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those are high risk, and a lot of those are um, HPV 16. But then there's a very small number of us that actually develop cancer, um, and that is because our body, <clears throat> despite the fact that HPV only is within skin, our body after a certain period of time is able to figure out that there's an infection in skin um, and get rid of uh, HPV. So what puts people at greater risk of ultimately developing cancer is if you have more than one HPV infection of a high-risk type at a time, and if it lasts for a long time. Because HPV needs to grow in full thickness skin and the bottom layer of skin is what is normally dividing. Mm -hmm. But as you get off of the basal layer of stratified squamous epithelium, cells are no longer dividing. And in fact, they even lose their nuclei. <clears throat> but HPV needs cells to be dividing so that it can use the DNA polymerase to make its own DNA. Mm -hmm. So it drives differentiating cells to continue to divide. And that's why you get a wart. You get a bump where cells are still dividing when no, okay. they no longer normally would be. So the upper cells that are normally quiescent are dividing all, the way, still all the way to the dead layer? 
Yeah, and then okay. and then so the viral DNA is being replicated <coughs> and amplified, and then encapsulated with the viral capsid proteins. And when your skin cells slough off, the virus goes as well. And that's how it's transmitted. And that's right. how it's transmitted. And when you have a persistent infection, the dysregulation that a high risk HPV induces in mm -hmm. cells, if it lasts for long enough, other problems happen, um, and ultimately you can get you know. Um, chromosome breaks, um, mm -hmm. dysregulation in cell cycle, not recognizing that too many wrong things have been happening, and those stochastic events are really what lead to cancer. And typically in cancers, you find that the HPV DNA that was episomal has actually gotten integrated into the cellular DNA. That's not good for the virus, mm -hmm. um, and it ultimately leads those cells to continually have the oncogenes and the oncoproteins that are expressed from HPV, you know, constitutively expressed in the cells. So this is why we have vaccines against these high-risk strains yeah. to prevent cancers, even though it's not a frequent event. It, it happens often enough to warrant immunization. Uh, yes, is and, the short answer, yes. And yeah. so w within so many years, there will, we will eradicate cervical cancers, for example, in, in the U.S.? Well, so no, but um, no for a couple reasons. Mm -hmm. So HPV 16 and 18 is included in the two FDA approved vaccines in the US. Right. Um, and they are associated with about 70% of cervical cancers. So then there's 30% that would not be protected against by the vaccine. Um, and uh, the quadrivalent vaccine also includes two low risk types that are associated mm -hmm. with about 90% of genital warts. Um, and in countries where they've had very good vaccination, they actually have seen a dip already in the number of genital warts that are coming in to be treated right. in an STD clinic. Um, so the vaccine is not, doesn't fully cover high risk types that are associated with cancer. Um, and unfortunately in the United States, the uptake for vaccination has been quite poor. And you need to be vaccinated before you're exposed mm -hmm. um, to the infections because it's not a therapeutic vaccine. It's only preventive. So what age do you get immunized? It's FDA approved down to the age of nine mm -hmm. and up to the age of 26 for the quadrivalent. And for the bivalent vaccine, which includes only 16 and 18, it's 10 to 25. Um, the quadrivalent is for boys and girls, and the, mm -hmm. the bivalent is only for girls. Um, but the uh, the ACIP and the American Academy of Pediatrics is recommending it at the 11 to 12 year old visit, which is when you would come in for your tetanus booster and other things, so it's joined at that visit. So you said the uptake is poor. What, roughly, do you know what percentage of kids are being immunized? Uh, starting the series, probably less than 30%, and it's mm -hmm. a three-shot series, so it's been pretty poor. Uh, is that because of the cost, in part? I think in the United States, vaccine uptake tends to be pretty slow at the start. For most things, you can see that with the vaccine against chickenpox and the vaccine against uh, meningococcus. Um, and there may be some increased reticence for people who are considering a vaccine that's associated with a sexually transmitted infection. Sure. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your area of interest. And to get there, let's look at the question, why are there high risk types and what differentiates them from the rest? So that's an interesting question because all HPVs need to do something in order for all of them to make virus. Um, but then there are things that a high-risk HPV does that a low-risk HPV either doesn't do or just does less well. So one of the main things that a high-risk HPV um, genome does is the two oncogenes that are associated with it, HPV E6 and E7, um, degrades P53, which um, regulates apoptosis. Um, and cellular senescence, and also degrades RB, so the retinoblastoma gene, which is really important in a cell cycle checkpoint, recognizing that all DNA is normal and healthy before you duplicate it to make a new cell. <clears throat> the other thing that high-risk E6 does is activates telomerase in epithelial cells. And in um, low-risk HPV infections, those things are somewhat affected, mm -hmm. but not significantly. And it's likely through the protein partnerships that low-risk E6 and E7 have versus high-risk. But don't all the serotypes <coughs> have to kick the cell into divide? That's the whole point, to kick the cell into dividing so the DNA replication machinery is available. Yeah, right? but I think it's not to the, the, the degree that a, that a high-risk high risk uh, infection does. So yeah. it's a matter of how much it does it, but <coughs> it does happen with the low-risks. It does, okay. but just not not good enough that it, you're sort of going over a, uh -huh. Okay, so the E6 and E7, uh, you said they antagonize P53, mm -hmm. and that is normally a protein that would sense 
DNA damage, for yes. example, mm -hmm. which would happen in a virus infection, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so the cell, the, the virus doesn't want that to happen. Right. And so it, it neutralizes that. The cells would apoptose, I guess. Right? They would apoptose. Mm -hmm. And then you said retinoblastoma, which is a cell cycle checkpoint protein. Right. So it normally keeps cells uh, from dividing unless conditions are good for dividing their nutrients and so forth. But the virus wants to kick start, right? Mm -hmm. So it gets rid of that protein as well. Right. And this is all for the virus. It doesn't want to cause cancer. No, and right. in fact, integrating into the cell is doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, you, it, viruses, it doesn't right? make virus. It needs to be episomal. So it's an accident. Yeah. Uh, in, in what fraction of the tumors is the DNA integrated? All of them? Typically all of them. There are very few cancers that have episomal HPV DNA. <clears throat> and there have been some studies trying to look at, uh, are there fragile points where HPV integrates in cells? Um, and how long does this happen? And can there be periods of time where you have both episomal DNA and integrated okay. DNA within a same cell? And um, you can have that happen, but typically over time the episomal DNA is lost. So this is actually a side, but it just popped into my head. If you, if, if you haven't been immunized and you are infected and you're developing a tumor, what can be done? It can be excised, I presume. Mm -hmm. And does that work? most of the time? Yeah, so that's the point of pap smears um, for sampling the cervix. It's harder to sample other places where you may be developing an HPV-associated cancer, so the vagina, the vulva, yeah. anal verge, head and neck cancers. But yeah, that's the purpose of pap smears, is looking for abnormal cells and abnormal cells that don't go away. And then ultimately you would biopsy and see how thick that, those abnormal cells are and then ultimately try to excise them. Yeah, in fact, we had an email, so I'm going to read it now because you'll be leaving before we get to it. This was actually from, I assigned my virology class to send emails to the show. Not that we need them, we get plenty, but I thought it would be a good exercise for them. So Michael asked, um, so we had talked about this technology where you evolve tree recombinases to recognize viral sequences. So for HIV, you evolve them to recognize the LTRs and it will then excise it. And so he asked, why can't you do, use this to remove HPV, integrated uh, HPV, genomes. And then my, my co-instructor uh, in this course told him that HPV doesn't integrate predictably and there is limited clonal expansion. Could you please explain how this virus infects cells so reliably in the transition zone between endocervix and ectocervix and yet a recombinase cannot be targeted there assuming you could get Cre into the cell? Mm. You understand what he's saying? I understand the first part for okay. sure. So, so um, HPV needs full thickness skin in order to go through its full life cycle, but it needs to infect the basal layer of that full thickness skin. And so you either get to that by a microabrasion or a little tear in the skin, mm -hmm. um, or you can get to it if you have single cell layer <coughs> columnar epithelium that then is transitioning into stratified squamous epithelium. You can get in basically on the side right. instead of through the top. The other thing is, since HPV requires full thickness skin for its normal viral life cycle. Although it's easy to get into uh, the basal cell at a site of transition, that's not a normal place for it to be replicating. And so it might be an easy place to infect, but then actually a bad place to have a normal right. viral right. life cycle. Okay. So he's asking, couldn't you excise the integrated DNA? And I think, you know, doing that probably will happen at some point in the future, but it seems to me surgical excision is the way to deal with the tumor, right? It's a lot simpler than putting but, a Cree recombinase in. I think, yeah. So that's probably the answer to that. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of yeah. course. So unlike a retrovirus, which has two LTRs, which are predictably at the ends, is that true of an HPV? Does it go in? I thought that was the other part of the question, because it can go in any circular uh, permutation yeah, 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 yeah. as well. It can. Right, right. And, and so part of the problem yeah. is the cells that grow out where HPV has been integrated are the cells that can grow the best. And the ones that can grow the best are the ones that are expressing E6 and E7. And I've also lost the regulatory um, gene E2, which typically decreases the expression level of E6 and E7. So people haven't been able to figure out if there is a specific breakpoint in HPV or a specific chromosome that they go into. But the ones that grow out are the ones that have lost E2 and still have E6 and E7. Yeah, that's what he means by it doesn't integrate predictably. Yes, it doesn't. That's right. And it's, yeah. not, it's not clonal, right? Uh, no. Different. So it's, it's very hard to use a recombinase for that reason because every cell is going to be different and it's, it's very different from the retroviruses where the LTRs are always there. Okay. And then he says, is it fair to think that HPV in cervical cancer is analogous to APC in colon cancer 
and that mm -hmm. both set off the steps necessary for tumor growth. Is there any commonality with the other steps, MIC, RAF, RAS, seen in cervical cancer and or any order in these changes? Obviously, it's a tough question. How would one even go about trying to understand the order of events if you wanted to know? Finally, are there any interventions to block E6 and E7 after infection and before tumor genesis? Does Anything? he get extra credit for asking five <laughs> questions? <laughs> oh, the course is over. He's got his grades. Uh, <laughs> I think they, I gave them all good. A's if they sent in a question. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, okay, so the first question was... Is there any commonality with colon cancer? Well, for cervical cancer, more than 99% of them have HPV, a high-risk type yeah. associated with it. So if you're going to stop the cancer, if you don't get infected, then that wipes out nearly all right. cervical cancers. There are other cancers where HPV is the majority, but not such a significant majority. So if you want to avoid cervical cancer, avoid the HPV infections that are high risk. Right. Um, and then thinking about the things that need to happen in order for it ultimately to become cancerous, things get started by HPV, but then it's those stochastic events that happen that it, right and are allowed to happen because HPV has dysregulated the cell right. to the point where they can't recognize and correct those things. Right, they keep dividing and accumulate mutations which eventually uh, add up to a tumor cell. Right. Yeah. Can you intervene to block E6 and E7? <clears throat> so there are people who are trying to develop therapeutic vaccines and really those need to be targeted against E6 and E7. The um, preventive vaccines that are FDA approved are to mount an antibody response to the L1 protein that's the major capsid protein of HPV. Um, but it is not at all able to target cells where HPV already is there and right. kill those cells okay. or block the genes. So one other thing I wanted to talk with you about is the telomerase. And we did, in the episode of TWIB we did with Michelle Osborne, we didn't touch on that. So I know that's one of your interests. Yeah. So tell us about that. So telomerase is an enzyme that extends the telomeric ends of linear chromosomes. And telomeric DNA in humans is a six nucleotide repeat. Um, and it caps the ends of chromosomes um, with basically nonsense DNA so that you don't have a gene at the end that could be mm -hmm. broken or mutated most easily. And telomeric DNA also helps um, cells not think that the ends of linear chromosomes is a double-stranded DNA break that needs to be repaired by attaching it to something else. <clears throat> and as cells divide, you typically lose 100 to 200 bases of that telomeric DNA with each cell cycle mm -hmm. wow. division. So what that does is telomeric DNA gets shortened with each cell cycle, and cells then ultimately know how old they are. And once you reach a certain age, a cell either goes through apoptosis or cellular senescence. And um, most somatic cells, that's what happens. You don't have any telomerase to extend that telomeric DNA. You age and then you slow to a stop or go through programmed cell death. And um, it, in most cancers, telomerase is activated so that cells no longer have a sense that they have gotten too old. Mm -hmm. And when you are too old, you probably have some mutations thrown in there too, which put you at risk of having cellular dysregulation beyond the fact that you are sort of too old. So if these are non-viral mm -hmm. induced cancers, these are mutations that randomly happen to activate the telomerase? Yeah, telomerase, exactly. yes, exactly. And in HPV associated cancers, mm -hmm. telomerase is universally activated. Is it, is it because the virus does something to do it? Yes, yeah. so high risk E6 <coughs> interacts with um, a protein called E6 associated protein. Mm -hmm. um, and the two of them together are able to activate telomerase um, in a number of different ways. Um, it does it both at the promoter level where it does um, uh, promoter activation. Um, and I've also done studies looking at post-transcriptional regulation that are able to increase um, the telomerase level, specifically at the catalytic subunit, where mm. its, its level of expression is really rate determining for enzymatic activity. So again, the virus needs to do this to keep mm -hmm. the cell living, right? It makes sense. Mm -hmm. And this happens with all um, types of human papillomaviruses, just to different extents? Well, so actually only the high-risk HPVs are the ones that activate okay. telomerase. And it's because it has a, a, a stronger affinity with E6-associated protein. Mm -hmm. So um, the, you activate the telomerase, the cells live longer, and then you accumulate mutations that make them tumorigenic. Yeah. And it, so in the end, the virus, the higher risk simply want to replicate more? Is that the idea? You know, I don't know. I don't know why they would 
want to do a better job than anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if low risk is good enough, why would you want more? It, it really is its um, ability to have different and stronger protein partnerships that really mm -hmm. set them apart. Um, so um, that really is ultimately what, yeah. what splits them apart. So we have telomerase activated, we have RB inhibited, P53, is there anything we're missing? Those are the main ones. Those are the main, Those ones. Are the main ones. And they do, and they high risk have to do all three in order to proceed to cancer. Yeah. So, so when, if you express only a high risk E6 and E7 together in a regular epithelial mm -hmm. cell in culture, I mean, normally epithelial cells will grow for a while in culture and then they'll slow to a stop. But if you put in a high risk E6 and E7 gene mm -hmm. and they're constitutively expressed, it's actually the loss of retinoblastoma and the activation of telomerase that will allow these cells to grow indefinitely in culture, so they mm. become immortalized. Right. They do not become um, tumorigenic, so they're not able to invade, um, but they're just able to keep on growing. Right. And in fact, people use that to immortalize cells in the lab, E6, the E7. You yeah. put them in a vector, you put it in, and you can immortalize your cells. Right. So the HeLa cells, mm -hmm. we now know, have HPV in them, and that's why they're immortal? Yeah, so they have HPV-18. Yep. And they, their telomerase is activated, the RB is inactivated, P53, all of that. Right. And this is, this is something we learned many years after they were originally isolated, which is 1951, I think. Yeah, right. right. Okay. So if the vaccine had been available then, we would not have had this. Sure. But then we wouldn't have HeLa cells either, which have been important yeah. in many. But we would have ways to immortalize cells now that we didn't have back then. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you know about this, but is it true that there are associations with head and neck cancers now with, with these viruses? Yeah, there are. So there are some subsets of head and neck cancers that um, have been associated with HPV. So there's been a minority mm -hmm. of um, the subset that have been found to be HPV positive. And over the past uh, 30 years, there's been an increase in the basically proportion of those cancers that are now HPV positive and an overall increase in total. Um, and that is likely related to changes in sexual behaviors. The same serotypes, the high yeah. risk? Mm -hmm. And how do they get there? Through oral sex. OK. Yep. Contact. And what's the frequency? Of head and neck cancers? The caused by HPVs. Caused by HPVs. There are some subsets that now are becoming the majority HPV positive. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing to know about this is it really affects a different population of patients. Mm -hmm. They tend to be younger. They tend to not be the drinkers and smokers associated with other head and neck cancers. And they've also shown that um, they respond differently to sort of the conventional treatments for those types of cancers. They're more radiotherapy um, sensitive. So eventually, if the vaccine uptake is good, we'll, th these will not increase in numbers. Yeah. And right? so there, there are people who are studying to try to figure out if that would be effective as well. Okay. I have one more HPV email I want to read. This is from a physician in Wisconsin, and he uh, writes, his name is Thomas, I am a pediatrician in Wisconsin and love your show and share your passion for educating the masses in whatever corner of the world you are in. So, hi, masses. <laughs> uh, thanks for what you do. I am also passionate about immunizations and would like to clarify some of the points in your recent podcast on HPV, which I thoroughly enjoyed. One, pap smears are not routinely recommended in, at initiation of sexual activity, primarily because most adolescent HPV is cleared spontaneously, though we don't know why. Due to this fact, it has recently been stated by several medical governing bodies that pap smears do not need to start until females are 21 years old. True. Right? right? We can vet it now. We yes, it's it. true. Okay, two, <laughs> HPV typing is not recommended routinely along with pap smears for most practices. It is quite a bit more costly than a pap smear. So what some practices do is if the pap smear is abnormal, they reflex that specimen to HPV typing. Even HPV typing is not specific because it is a panel of HPV types that includes, I think, 13 of the most common cancer-causing types of HPV. It does include 16 and 18. So if the reflex HPV testing is positive, that person may get more frequent follow-up if reflex HPV testing is negative, they may space out the repeat pap smear testing. Hope this helps. Keep up the good work and the bad jokes. <laughs> is that all right? <clears throat> it is, it okay. is. I mean, basically what, what finally is happening with the algorithm for management of pap smears is we're recognizing the natural history of HPV infection. Most people get HPV within the first few years after sexual debut, mm -hmm. and most of us get rid of it. 
So it is inappropriate to sample a young woman um, when you know you're going to find something positive, and that positivity does not mean yeah. much uh, when you think about it later. The flip side is when you are older, you should not really have a persistent HPV infection and so need to be followed more closely. Great. It's, it's not often we have an expert to confirm an expert's opinion on this show, so that's really good. Um, let's move on to uh, Roger Hendricks sitting next to me here. I love that you have a, a name with an X on the end. That's great. Do, you, do people make Jimi Hendrix jokes? My brother Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> And I, one thing I want to just touch on briefly, I don't know if everyone knows this, but he did his PhD with Jim Watson. Mm -hmm. That must have been a very interesting experience, right? It was. It was uh, <laughs> I think the, the thing that was best about it was the, the group of people that, that Jim had gathered around him yeah. in his lab. That was a really intense and sure. enjoyable sort of environment. What did you work on? In his Sage lab? Lambda. Lambda, really? Yeah. Was Joan Stites in the lab at the time? She was. Okay, because we've done one of her papers on mm -hmm. TWIV, and, and Rich Condit was a postdoc with Joan Stites. You know, it's a very small scientific world. And he said that she used to let people publish papers on her own because Jim Watson let people right. publish papers. That's, yeah. that's, right. Did, that's you, right. did you publish any uh, on your own? Yeah. That's amazing. All right, so you did a postdoc with... Um, uh, Dale Kaiser. Dale Kaiser, another phage person, mm -hmm. right? So you're thoroughly imbued with phages, and that's what you continue to do today. That's right? right. So on your website, you have this wonderful one thing, and one thing I wanted to talk about was this work. You have this wonderful picture of a splash pond uh, somewhere in, off the coast of Maine. Mm -hmm. And the splash pond is a small pond in the rocks, actually, and there's a larger body of water behind it. So mm -hmm. you're looking at phages in this splash pond. Can you yeah. tell us a little about that? Well, it's, it's one example of, of a lot of the environments that people have isolated phages from. Uh, this is a sort of an interesting one because uh, it gets rained in and it gets, uh, you know, when there's a storm, the, the sea, uh, sea water washes in. And, oh, so this is salt and, water in here? Yeah, and okay. it sits in the sun and, and, uh, and various things grow up in it and they include phages. But I think one of the things that... that uh, people have found in, say, the last decade and more uh, is that phages are much more prevalent in the environment and, in fact, just about everywhere mm. uh, than we ever imagined. So the first hint of that was from some Norwegian scientists who went down to the local fjord and scooped up some water out of the fjord and centrifuged it down onto an electron microscope sample grid and looked and just counted how many phages were there. And if, if you'd done the, the typical laboratory assay for phages uh, by bringing the seawater into the lab and, mm -hmm. and plating it out on your favorite E. coli K12 or whatever your favorite bacterium was, you might have gotten a, a plaque or two growing up, but maybe not. Uh, but what you find if you, if you look at all the phages in there, which includes uh, phages that grow on every conceivable host that they might find in the, in the water, mm. uh, you get about 10 million per milliliter. Uh, and so uh, if you multiply that by the number of milliliters in the oceans of the world and put in a fudge factor for, for the ones that are in soil and places mm -hmm. like that, uh, we come up with a, a number of individual phages on the planet of 10 to the 31st power, which is uh, actually not only an amazing number, but it, it really changes the way you can think about uh, the way these, these viruses evolve. It's more than Avogadro, yeah. right? Yeah, quite a bit more. Um, and you made up a very interesting analogy to explain, not an analogy, a way of explaining how big mm -hmm. a number that is. Yeah, well, I, I have two favorite ones. One, one is that if you laid them end to end, they would extend out into space for, uh, you can guess. 200 million light years? You got it right. <laughs> that's a long way. That's it, I think that's the it. nearest galaxy is 50 million, I think. Uh, I think Andromeda is 10 or 20. 10 or 20, it's a long mm -hmm. ways. That's amazing for something you can't see. So if you've ever heard of that 
for Roger is the person who came up with that. I always, it's one of the first lectures I give to my virology mm -hmm. class, to the 200 million light years. And there's always someone who comes up and says, how do you know that? Yeah. <laughs> well. Now I can say it's Roger. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So these, why did you pick this pond, or, is, or this splash pond, or, or it's just an example of it's, other It's but, just an example of, of places we've looked. We've, we've uh, filtered water out of there and concentrated mm -hmm. virions out of it. And, and uh, done that in various other places. And, and we uh, collaborate uh, in Pittsburgh with Graham Hatful mm -hmm. uh, on sequencing genomes of, of these phages. And so we've, we've done oh, a couple of hundred now of uh, various sorts of phages. And, and it's amazingly uh, informative about how these viruses evolve. Uh, and the main thing that you discover, or the most obvious thing you discover, mm -hmm. is that they're the champions of swapping genes with each other. Uh, every genome is a mosaic of all the other genomes, mm -hmm. right. and uh, which causes all sorts of headaches for the people who like to uh, do taxonomy of viruses and sure. put them in right. hierarchical categories. So, do you do you sequence the total DNA, or do you purify? You said you purify the phages and you Most, sequence Mostly that. what we do is, is purify the phages and sequence whole genomes. Okay. We've done a little bit of what's called metagenomic sequencing, but uh, that's not our, our main thrust. Do you try and grow them on hosts, or you, just, you don't bias them in any way? Uh, well, most of the, I guess all the ones that we've sequenced are ones that we can grow on a host. Uh, okay. But you could... You could also take the other approach to sequence the whole population and see what you get, right? Right. It's, um, and, and that's becoming possible with the, the new high throughput yeah. sequencing. But the, the, <clears throat> at least the radical problem with doing that is that these things swap DNA uh, so vigorously uh, in their normal lifestyle that, mm -hmm. that uh, if you've got uh, a particular hybrid in your sequencing, you wouldn't know whether it was put yeah. together in the computer or, or uh, in, the, in the cell. So the bioinformatics is a nightmare of assembling all this, especially with yeah. short sequence runs, which mm -hmm. are more typical right. of, the, of the deeper methods, right? Yeah, and I think we're, we're getting, getting closer to being able to, to do that well. But. So you can find phages in these kinds of waters, but, and, and they're concentrated on your website, it says 100 million per ml. That's because the water is evaporating and there's a high density yeah. growth. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the concentrations that you find in the environment vary all over the place. I've, since we're here in New Orleans, I've calculated uh, the, the flux of phages out of the Mississippi, uh, which is uh, somewhere in, in the range of 10 to the 17th per second. Uh, 10 which, to the 17th per second. That's, that's about 10 million times the human population of the planet. Stanley, you got that number? You're going to tweet it? Okay. <laughs> 10 to the 17th per second phages total flowing out of the Out of, of the, the mouth of the, of the Mississippi. Wow. It would be a little less if it weren't at flood stage. <laughs> you also had a number for the, number, the total number of lytic infections in the ocean. That was your calculation yeah. as well? Yeah. Okay. So, the, um, so we, we have a pretty good idea of how many phages there are in the oceans. And the ecologists who study these things uh, tell us that that whole population turns over every few days. Wow. And so you go to the back of your envelope and you can, you can figure out that there's about, in, in order to replenish that population, yeah. you have to have about 10 to the 24th infections per second uh, to produce. And each of those infections is, is a chance for some kind of genetic mischief. And, and so when you, when you think about these numbers, uh, it makes it a lot easier to understand how, how the evolution of these viruses can, can do the amazing things right. we see when we compare their genomes. When you started working on Lambda with Jim Watson, did you ever envision that it would end up at this point with these numbers and these, this amount of exchange? No, well, the, I mean, the idea of, of knowing the DNA sequence of the genome was yeah. completely foreign at the time. It's amazing. I mean, I'm stunned by these numbers, that, that, and I've seen them before. But if you think about it, those, just the number of infections per second is huge. Well, and the diversity in the population is also amazing. I mean, if you, if you sequence a new phage that comes 
say, from a host that you don't have a lot of phage sequences for, mm -hmm. you typically can recognize about a quarter or a third of the genes uh, by matches in the, right. in the public databases. And the rest are completely new sequences. Nothing like you've ever seen before. No, so I, I think you know there's more genetic diversity in the in the phage population than probably any other <coughs> compartment of the biosphere. So we have genes, many, many hundreds, thousands of genes that we've never seen before, with no recognizable motifs or structures. We have no idea what they do. Mm -hmm. And you could take any one of these and express it and try and figure out some of its properties, right? right? I mean, it's how many, 10 to the what PhD projects there? <laughs> it's amazing. I, I don't know that the, the numbers go that high. <laughs> it's phenomenal. So um, does anyone do this? Does anyone try and figure out the functions? Well, yeah, I mean, one, one thing that's, <clears throat> that's in a sense frustrating about doing all the sequencing is that, is that I mean, we used to, when we were uh, applying for NIH grants for this initially, we would say this is not hypothesis-driven research. This is hypothesis-generating <laughs> research. And uh, I guess that worked because we got the grants. Uh, but uh, the number of, of interesting biological problems that, that you can see just by looking at the, sure. the sequences is, is phenomenal. And, and you, you just have to pick and choose. And, yeah. Uh, so when you, again, when you sequence your entire genomes, you are selecting for phages that will grow on specific bacterial right. hosts. What kinds of hosts are you using? Uh, well, uh, one of the, the main ones that we've used is Mycobacterium smegmatis okay. because uh, uh, my colleague Graham, Graham Hantel has a particular interest in that. But we've, we've done lots of others. We've done enteric hosts. We've done uh, Streptomyces. We've done Sphingomonas pausimobilis, which is uh, don't know that one. It's, that's the scum on the bottom of your shower curtain. Uh, Not mine. <laughs> Sphingomonas. Yeah. Phages of that. And so there are many, many more host specificities there. Oh, right? yeah. Right? And so for most of the phages, you don't know what kind of host they are. In fact, you can't tell from looking at the sequence either. No. Right? Do you have any estimate of the total diversity of phages? We know the number. How many different yeah. ones are there? Is each one different? Well, I mean, there certainly are, are clones. If you, you know, if you infect a, uh, a cell in the lab and grow it up, or you infect a cell in the sewer and, and it grows up, you get right. you right. get a certain size clone of of identical phages. But uh, but they don't say, stay identical for very long. So we've uh, some of the phages we've sequenced have come from have been phages that have been studied in the lab for a while mm -hmm. and. If those haven't fairly recently been cloned by putting them through a single plaque, uh, we find diversity in the sequence, and uh, so it's you know it's it's hard to put a time scale on yeah. on the evolution, but uh, uh, it's probably faster than we think. So if you look at the all the total genes in the microbial communities. It, uh, aside from phage genes, is there an overlap with these unknown phage genes? You see signatures of in the in the microbes. Uh, sometimes, but yeah. uh, most often not. And uh, most often, the I mean, the the ones the genes that we recognize as being related to bacterial genes are often things like DNA replication genes or nucleotide metabolism right. genes, right. things like that. It's amazing. It's amazing to me. So, if you took uh, Two, phage, two clonal phages, as clonal as you can get them, isolated from one source, and you co-infected a bacterium, would you get out a mosaic? Uh, well, potentially. I mean, that's, of course, how we, for uh, decades, have, have done genetic crosses mm -hmm. between phages in the lab. Uh, but I think uh, the other thing you have to realize is that most bacterial strains have prophages in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, it doesn't matter whether you have a co-infection or not. There's right. an opportunity for, for making a hybrid. And, and that, I mean, we don't really have a very good handle on how often that happens. But it doesn't have, have to happen very often, given the frequency of, of infection on, on a global scale. So if you look in all the microbial sequences that we have, like the, the global ocean data set, you must find 
signatures of many of your phages in them, right? Yeah. Right. And so I think I mean, it's it's hard to get a, a grip on the the diversity, but um, mm -hmm. certainly we we've now I think you know the community has now sequenced something approaching a thousand uh, genomes for, just for the tail yeah. phages, which are the ones that we are mostly concerned with, and uh, I think there's there's not yet much sign of a, a convergence on hmm. on a uh, conserved set of genes. Uh, most of, are most of these ten to the thirty first phages tailed phages? Uh, we think so. I mean, something like ninety five percent of all the phages that have been reported in the literature are tailed phages. I think hmm. uh, that underestimates what what the others are, and and we don't have yeah too good a handle on that. And you can't tell again from the genome whether it is a tailed phage or not. Uh, you pretty much yeah, can, can, yeah, because uh, there are particularly the the structural genes of the of the virion uh, are recognizable and right. are characteristic of uh, tailed phages. Right. So you have worked. This is a more recent uh, exploration for your laboratory. Yeah. You worked for many years on structure of these tailed phage capsids, yeah, right? And still do. And you still do. Yeah. Which is more compelling to you of the two? Uh, well, they're they're compelling in different ways. I mean, the 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 structural stuff is, uh, in some ways, seems more rigorous and mm -hmm. and uh, and precise, and, uh, but the the genomic stuff uh, gives you a, a really nice global picture of what's going on, and 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 gives you. Uh, if not a completely well-focused picture, it gives you uh, a glimpse into into how the evolution of these work, and, and I'm I'm getting to be convinced that that phages have a a more major role in in evolution of of the biological world than than people have realized. And you have a gut full of phages too, as well. Absolutely, which are doing things we don't quite understand yet. So it's a good thing you don't have to choose between the two projects, right? Absolutely. That's well, and, and in fact, I think one thing that's been really interesting for me is that, is that uh, thinking about phages from these two different points of view means that I can think of things that, that I wouldn't be able to do if I were concentrating on one or the other. Yeah. Uh, so I've been thinking about how, how uh, the size of the genome can evolve uh, in ways that are constrained by the size of the capsid. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that leads to some interesting thoughts. What's the biggest uh, tailed phage genome we know of? Uh, it's, it's a phage called G. Uh, G-E-E. -E. -E. Just, just, <laughs> just G. G. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the, the guy who isolated it was named Giovanni Donelli. It's great. Uh, so great that's name. That's perhaps where the G comes from. Uh, it's, it infects Bacillus megatherium, which is a mm -hmm. big cell, and uh, it has a genome uh, size of uh, 497,513 base pairs. Okay. Not the biggest, though. It's, it's dwarfed by Mimi viruses. Yeah, it's, it's not as big as, as the yeah. Mimi viruses, but it's the biggest phage we know. Is that what you were talking about before we started, the jumbo phages? Yeah. yeah half a million base pairs. And most of the genes are unique again. Right. Are there any questions for Dr. Hendricks? This is an opportunity to ask a legend <laughs> who worked with very famous people. Um, hi there. This is uh, Andrew Jeremy with Nature Reviews Microbiology. Um, with the large numbers of phage at play in the world, in the ocean, um, can you use them as a reporter for the health of the ocean? So if there are, for instance, oxygen minimum zones, do you see a huge drop in the phage number and you, you can predict what's uh, going to happen in the oceans based on that? I think, I think the answer is probably yes, but, but not yet, because uh, that, those ecological aspects uh, of the population are not that well worked out. But uh, there's actually been a lot of interest in, from people like oceanographers and other environmental scientists in uh, these questions. Uh, I mean, people like Curtis Suttle uh, have, have uh, made uh, a big point about the fact that, that the, the viral shunt, as they call it, in the oceans is an important part of carbon and energy cycling. Uh, 
uh, and and so I think there's there's going to be more interest in that, and uh, eventually we'll understand it well enough to address your point. Stan, this is Stanley Malloy from San Diego State. Roger, you said that a lot of the phage genomes are not found within the sequenced bacterial genomes. If the phage were temperate phage, you would expect to find a fair number of those hits. Does that imply that most of these phage out in nature are lytic phage? Uh, well, I, I probably said that a little wrong. Uh, if, if, you, if you take uh, phage sequences and, and ask GenBank uh, where they come from, a lot of them uh, are, are listed as bacterial sequences, but I think that's because uh, of the prophages. So it's more a, a problem of, an, of annotation than reality. Rachel, I think this is a good time if you would like to leave. Thank you. Not that I'm kicking you out. Right <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the early dismissal. This has been great. Thank, Adam, you. thank you for joining us. Okay. Have a good flight back thank from you. the University of Washington. Thank you. The one person in the globe with a name longer than mine. Okay, let's move on to Harmit on my right, who's from the same institution as Rachel, so we still have the Northwest represented. By the way, if you look at the uh, demographics of TWIV, the region of the U.S. that has the most downloads is the Seattle-Tacoma region. Is that right? It's probably my lab. <laughs> That's what they're doing every afternoon. I'm like, come here, they're all glued with their iPod sort of <laughs> headphones on. I, I don't know. Do you, I mean, I'm sure it's not your lab, but is there a lot of technology there? Is that There's a lot of technology, and people are just very interested. There's a lot of community forums. People are trying very hard to keep abreast of science and yeah. how it impacts public policy. I think it's great. Um, it's the really, a, uh, I can show you the pie chart later. It's a, it's a vast majority of all the downloads. So you're, one of your interests that really fascinates me that I'd like to talk about is called paleovirology, or learning about paleovirology from interactions of viruses and hosts. So well, tell us what paleovirology is. Is it done by old virologists like uh, <laughs> Roger and I? Uh, it, it can be. Uh, in fact, uh, I think the concept of paleovirology is actually quite old. The idea is that we clearly have these fossil remnants of old viruses that are in our genome, and we can try to reconstruct old infection episodes from the direct imprints that these viruses have left. And until recently, we used to think that most of these imprints are going to come from retroviruses because this is an obligate part of their life cycle to imprint in the uh, host genome. As Rachel said, sometimes other viruses can do it, mm -hmm. but this is not an obligate part of the life cycle. Uh, however, just the last couple of years has been sort of a renaissance movement where people have begun to recognize that all kinds of viruses have left imprints that are basically shared back to common ancestors of mammals and common ancestor of primates. Um, so for instance, we have many imprints of the Borna viruses in our own genome. Uh, we have imprints of Ebola virus that have infected animals multiple times, and uh, circo viruses, et cetera. So each of these essentially provides us a unique snapshot of a particular virus. So for instance, if you can say that a virus left an imprint in a primate genome uh, 35 million years ago, you know that the virus was in existence 35 million years ago. And you can actually use that imprint to try to get a pretty good guess as to what the virus look like 35 million right. years ago because right. it left that imprint. And so it's a really great way. It's almost like uh, archaeology or sort of using these fossilized viruses to try to reconstruct what they look like when they were at their infectious best right. uh, and at what time frame. Interestingly, the, the HPVs, although they integrate, they don't go into the germline apparently. That's right. So we don't see any evidence of them in any old species, right? So that's actually the drawback of the system. So even most retroviruses don't actually infect the germline. So mm -hmm. for instance, we've never seen a HIV uh, you know, imprint in the germline, even though HIV-like lentiviruses have made at least two separate imprints um, in the germline. This is both in rabbit genomes and in lemur genomes. But it's a very happenstance. It's an extremely rare occurrence. So, so on the face of it, you look at the human genome and you realize 9% of our genome is made up of dead fossilized viruses, so, which is a lot. And yet that's a staggeringly small number of representatives of the actual viral infections mm -hmm. that sort of plagued us. So more recently, uh, people like me have started viewing, okay, what else can we use from the human genomic record to try to reconstruct mm 
what these old viral infections might have looked like. And one signature that we've begun to use uh, with varying degrees of success is every time a virus is sort of in an arms race, it enters a new host, it enters into a new arms race with the host repertoire of antiviral genes. And it has a unique sort of selective signature of Im that it imposes on these new host genes. And the cool thing is that these host genes, how they evolve, is also trapped in their genome. So the, we can essentially use the evolutionary record of host gene evolution to try to basically identify, aha, that's an episode where this particular host gene that is known to be specific against retroviruses mm -hmm. went on a very, very rapid sort of adaptive uh, walk. And so we can say, okay, 15 million years ago we had. Uh, so the specificity of the interaction basically determines the strength of your conclusion of, as to which paleovirus affected us at what time. This is an aside, but um, before you go on, this 9% of the genome, is that the number? That's right. Is it, we always debate this on TWIB, is it random, it hasn't gotten rid of yet, or does it have some function? Can we so tell? clearly some of them, so we call these paleoviral gifts, so some of them are clearly preserved. Uh, we have an expectation of uh, how long a piece of DNA or, a, or an open reading frame will remain open. Mm -hmm. And uh, that number in mammals is close to around 5 million years at upper level. Some of these viral uh, open reading frames that have entered say primate genomes more than 35 million years ago, are still open. open. And, and we have a handful of examples, but they're spectacular examples. Uh, so one of the most celebrated ones is the gene called syncytin, which mm -hmm. is uh, the gene that is actually de derived from the envelope gene of a human endogenous retrovirus 35 million years ago. All, all primates show a common inheritance of this particular imprint at the same part of the genome in all of their genomes. And interestingly, while the rest of the viral genome is completely abraded away, the envelope gene, which causes the infectious capacity of the virus, mm -hmm. has been preserved almost as if the host genome wanted to do something useful with it. And what, it turns out that the same gene is employed for cell-cell fusion now uh, in trophoblast uh, development, which is necessary for a developing fetus to actually acquire nutrients from mom. So we've essentially taken viral lessons mm -hmm. in order to do sort of placental live birth. That's amazing. So obviously, maintaining an open reading frame for that long, there has to be some selection for that. that that's and exactly this, In this case, we know the function. And there are some other examples as well? There's uh, at least four envelope genes that mm -hmm. are known. Uh, another one is also expressed in the placenta. It's probably also doing the same function as syncytin. It's uh, not, uh, you know, not very creatively named syncytin mm -hmm. 2. Uh, but uh, there are two others that are not actually expressed in the placenta. We have no idea what they're doing. And that's just the envelope genes, but there's a whole bunch of gag genes and other genes that have been domesticated, and also these other viruses have left. And there are also reverse transcriptases produced, right? That's right. So the, it turns out that most of the time the reverse transcriptase is not preserved. So except for the very young uh, viral okay. fossils, the polymerase uh, gene is usually not. It's almost as if we are keeping the, uh, or we are trying to preserve the structural components of the virus for some reason, but the reverse transcriptase or the polymerase components are usually not preserved. Okay, so getting back to your strategy for doing paleovirology by looking at the interplay of the host and the virus, give us an example of how you do that. So, uh, for instance, we uh, have done some work with a, a host antiviral gene called TRIM5. TRIM5 was discovered by Joseph Sudrowski's lab as the reason, one of the primary reasons why rhesus macaques do not get infected with HIV-1 or cannot get infected. That's because they encode this protein that can bind and glob onto the incoming HIV-1 capsid and then sort of target it for degradation. Signal to the system to turn on the immune response. We also have a version of TRIM-5, but our version is very ineffective against uh, the HIV-1 capsid. We basically ran through the whole spectrum of uh, retroviruses and realized that the human TRIM5 is actually only really good at uh, defeating the entropic murine leukemia virus, or NNLV. Mm -hmm. And sort of, that sort of led to some head scratching, and some people proposed, well, we've been living with rodents for long enough that maybe that imposed a selective pressure. But uh, something um, perhaps a little bit closer to home was the fact that there are NMLV-like retroviruses that have actually entered some of our relatives in their genome. So mm -hmm. there's a virus called Peter one that has uh, left about 100 imprints in the chimpanzee genome and 100 distinct imprints in the gorilla genome, but we don't have a single imprint. Mm -hmm. 
And so genetically, when you sort of begin to assess, you realize that at least some of the changes that occurred in the lineage leading to human TRIM5 actually conferred a protection when you resurrect the Peter, you know, capsid proteins. And so you're essentially trying to resurrect an arms race that existed five million years ago to try to explain what happened. Um, in this instance, the single amino acid change that happened to protect against Peter was also actually responsible for loss of protection against HIV. So it's a ah. sort of a fitness trade-off story mm -hmm. where an adaptation to an ancient virus might have led to loss of adaptation to a younger virus. So that's why we, our trim doesn't work against HIV. That's one of the ideas. Uh, several reasons. The, the idea is that okay. we've, we've been shaped by viruses that were you know, not like uh, HIV-1 in their capsid. And when we put all our eggs in that basket, we sort of right. lost our ability to, to. So using retroviruses to do this kind of analysis is useful because you have a, a, a genome fossil that you can track back. But for other viruses, you, you don't have that, right? It's very challenging. So most of the time, what you're using as surrogates or stand-ins for these ancient viruses are their current day versions or current day relatives, which means you can never make a contemporaneous argument uh, because mm -hmm. you can't sort of say for sure that Borna viruses or hepatitis C viruses were exactly present at this point. But the idea is that if you can show that the selective signature is so unique and so specific on this particular antiviral gene, then that can actually give you really high confidence that the surrogate or stand-in that you're using is in fact appropriate. Mm -hmm. Everything sort of is contingent on the fact that all, everything we know about paleoviruses is actually educated by the viruses we know of. It's right. completely possible that you know, we have a whole slew of viral imprints that have no ex existing relatives and we would have no means of reconstructing them. It would be like the fate genomes that Roger was talking about. There could be many such uh, genomes existing in animal genomic sequences, but we'd have no idea that th these are interesting. Yeah, because they don't exist now. Yeah, there, there's a, a, a sort of a parallel on the phages. They, the phage sequences, even among the tailed phages, uh, have diverged to such an extent that, that although there are reasons to, to think that they all have common ancestry, right. uh, they've completely lost any, uh, if, you, if you pick a pair of, say, capsid protein sequences at random, the chances are good that you can't recognize any sequence similarity. But there's another connection between the, the structural work and the genomics, there's, there's been structural work uh, that makes a good case that, that all of the capsid proteins of, of uh, the tailed phages have a common ancestry because they have a common protein fold. And that, that uh, commonality has even been extended to herpes viruses, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. uh, really for the first time gives, gives us a, uh, a hint about the, the time scale of the evolution of these Right. suggests that, that there were already uh, viruses that uh, were ancestors to the current herpes viruses and tailed phages that, that existed maybe as early as before the, the uh, three domains of cellular life split apart, so mm. you know, three or four billion years ago. And if they already looked that way by then, they probably had been evolving for some time before that. Yeah. So, and then there may be viruses that were present but disappeared. And there are marks of them in genomes, but we have no clue because they're not here right now. That's right. And, and so we, we might find something really interesting. So, I mean, it's, it, it's, we don't, it, it's, even, uh, it's even sort of a little bit more difficult than that because all of these metagenomic projects that Roger was talking about, you know, but whenever you find a virus that assembles and you say, oh, that looks like an astrovirus, so we're going to call it astrovirus 6. But what what you don't realize is that in the dustbin of these metagenomic projects are fully assembled circles of what clearly look like bona fide entities, whether mm -hmm. these are viruses or virioids or something of that note. Yeah. And I think once we start going back through our dustbin of these metagenomic projects, which I think is a daunting task because each of these is several gigabytes, uh, gigabytes of information, yeah. um, I think there's, there's going to be a lot of information here. Even we have such a poor knowledge of the viruses that affect us today, that actually figuring out what viruses affected us purely by bioinformatic means is going to be very daunting. Yeah, and it's certainly the case that the majority of sequences in any of those metagenomes uh, don't match anything in, in GenBank. So, Ken, in your case, you use trim, and another protein you've looked at is tetherin. Uh, 
That's right. another cellular antagonist. And you can look at the changes that have occurred over evolution and surmise what kind of viral pressures we're putting. And you can test those today. We have viruses that you can use and test against the different versions. Yes, yeah, so tethering is a great example of something where we not only have this adaptation leading up to the human lineage, but we have a real life a case of a virus adapting in order to deal with the sort of changes. So, so for instance, uh, most viruses, most lentiviruses like SIV or SIV from chimpanzee use an accessory protein called NEF to target tetherin and essentially antagonize it. Tetherin's job, tetherin was discovered by Paul Binash and John Gutelli as a protein that essentially tethers viruses just before they're about to bud off and essentially keeps them tethered so that they can't go on to make a sort of another out of infection. NEF essentially degrades this protein or antagonizes it by some other means such that you can no, no longer sort of are blocked at the cycle. But the NEF actually binds tetherin in this very small patch in the end terminal tail. It turns out that that patch is completely missing mm. So in humans. So when SIV CPZ was faced with the prospect of a tetherin, it could not defeat because it was missing the interaction surface. It actually recruited a completely different accessory protein called VPU in order to do this job, now binding tether in a completely different part of the protein. And we know that this happened just in the lineage leading to HIV-1 because HIV-1 is the only VPU that continues to maintain this activity, whereas all the other viruses have NEF. So we've essentially trapped this uh, uh, host virus interaction perfectly in terms of the, the way the viruses have dealt with the problem. Have you done this for other viruses that would be inhibited by tetherin? So we've not done this uh, for a number of viruses, partly because of what you said. We just know a lot about lentiviruses and these uh, sort of uh, uh, evolutionary stepping stones are just more densely populated. Uh, but it would be a very good idea to do it, for instance, for a number of these viruses, including Ebola, now that we have sure. more information. And you've also done it for a, an interleukin in a, in a parasite. Right. That's right. So that's actually a story which we don't have the antagonism. But another thing that we've seen just purely from evolutionary signatures is we can actually use where the evolution is happening, where the adaptation is happening, to at least infer that some sort of antagonist is involved. So in the case of, for instance, PKR, which is a probably closer example, mm -hmm. we know that PKR's interaction with its substrate called EIF2-alpha is actually should be very conserved because that's what the host mm -hmm. wants. But it turns out that that is actually one of the most rapidly evolving surface on this kinase, right. despite the fact that its substrate is completely frozen in evolution. <laughs> and the only way we can reconcile that is that some viral protein is actually attacking the exact same surface because it's such an Achilles heel. And we actually know such proteins, which are these uh, EIF2 alpha mimic proteins from pox viruses. Mm. Right. That essentially, right. and so that creates an arms race in the very surface you'd expect to be conserved. And we see the same signatures with interleukin-4 and its receptor at the interaction surface, leading us to presume, although we don't know, that some sort of helminth uh, parasite probably encodes an IL-4 mimic that mm -hmm. is essentially doing right. exactly the same interaction. So this is a case where we don't know whether such a mimic exists or existed, but that's what we surmise. Are there such antagonists in phages that could be studied in a, in a similar way? Cellular yeah. proteins that would inhibit the virus? Yeah, there's um, actually a huge list and a, a certainly incomplete list of, of uh, evidence of, of the biological warfare between phages and their hosts. One that we, we heard about at this meeting uh, that's, that's been of interest recently is the so-called CRISPR system, yep. uh, which uh, is, has been characterized as an adaptive immunity system for, for bacteria. Uh, there are, uh, there's an example in, in T4 uh, where uh, T4 needs to use a particular tRNA that the host provides. Mm -hmm. And the host uh, in some, some bacteria has a, has a system uh, to when it detects an infection by the phage, it cleaves the, the uh, anticodon loop of the tRNA to inactivate it. And so T4 has, has uh, countered by uh, developing uh, an RNA ligase that puts it back together. <laughs> so there, there are endless stories like that. It's, 
you know, the warfare has been going on for billions of years, and, and uh, we keep uncovering new examples of it. We have a question from the internet. Uh, yeah, this is a question from the Ustream chat. Um, I believe this is for Dr. Hendricks. Uh, Derek Tolley wants to know, do phages swap genomes primarily by co-infecting hosts, or are there other methods? Um, well, uh, they, they do it by infecting hosts, uh, and sometimes that's co-infection, but we think more often it's, it's uh, a single phage infecting a, uh, a cell that has prophage DNA, and of course the, the host's own DNA uh, is there uh, liable to be picked up in addition to the prophage DNA. Uh, so I, I think we don't know of any examples of where you can, you can reconstruct the, the genomes outside of the cell, but uh, uh, any time a phage infects a cell, uh, it's going to find some other phage DNA and some bacterial DNA that it can recombine with. We should probably mention that someone we mentioned before is now sitting in the audience, Graham Hatful. There he is. And he mentioned your collaboration. Do you have a question for Dr. Hendricks? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have about 20 minutes left. At least the mic is right there. Any other questions from the audience before we move on? I have one last question for you. So this is beautiful, and it tells you a lot about, I, I like this, what do you call it, an arms race? Yes. Between the virus and the host. Is it, does it have any practical value? So we, what we hope to learn is actually the... So essentially what we have laid out for us is not just a fossil record of the viruses that infected us, but if you look carefully, it's also a record of the host genomes that face those viruses and obviously survive. Mm -hmm. And if you can reconstruct the adaptive changes they made in response to those contemporaneous viruses, some of these viruses are things that we worry about greatly uh, today, things like HIV, Ebola, Borna viruses, et cetera. And so what we hope to learn is generalized rules of adaptation Potentially, that could lead to uh, some sort of therapeutic intervention. But uh, I always hesitate to say that since there's so much unknown, it's possible this could break tomorrow, but it's also possible sure. it could take years sure. to sort of analyze. Yeah, it's a kind of a squishy question, but something that we, sh we need to think about, yeah. no matter. So if none of you, if any of you haven't read this work, um, I highly recommend you do. It's beautiful. I love it. I think it's novel and refreshing. and. Uh, presents things in a new way. Dr. Hatful. So, so I have a question for, for, for both guests, which is I wondered if you could just reflect on the, the different time scales of the origins and evolution of viruses. Um, for the bacterial hosts, clearly we're talking about a time scale which is very, very different from the time scale of animal viruses, eukaryotic viruses. And I just wonder if you could comment on how that time scale how you think that influences the diversity and the nature of the viral genomes that we see today? Well, I can start out. Um, I, th I think, first of all, I, I'm not sure I would agree that, that uh, the phage scale is longer than the, the animal virus scale. I mean, it's clear that there haven't been animal viruses prior to animals, but uh, the, the structural similarities that I was referring to uh, imply uh, common ancestry for the viruses that now infect animals and, and bacteria. Uh, and so, uh, and there's, there's more to that story than I, I said. That is, there, there are other groups of viruses that have completely different capsid proteins uh, that have also diverged past recognizability, but because of the common structure, uh, we, we infer common ancestry. Uh, and so, so uh, in that sense, I, I would say that, that uh, at least some of the animal viruses and at least some of the phages, including all the tailed phages, uh, have common ancestry that goes back probably before the, the divergence of the, uh, the other, uh, the cellular domains. Uh, whether that applies to all viruses I, is probably dubious. I mean, I think uh, for example, for the retroviruses, we don't have any of that kind of information uh, to say whether or not they, they have common ancestry that far back. Uh, but uh, at least for some, uh, 
it's there. And, and I think it, it's really, uh, I mean, the, the stuff that, that you were talking about is really quite beautiful and, and, uh, and gives us a, a different window uh, on a somewhat more recent time scale. But uh, so did, did that answer your question? So I, I can only say that numbers, when you hear numbers like 10 to the 31, one of the things that evolutionary biologists worry about a lot is population bottlenecks. So let's assume that there was, in fact, that there was a pre-LUCA phage diversity that had already built up. What is the likelihood that any of that diversity is still present today? And given the cycling time, every time you go through a generation, there's a risk that you're going to lose some diversity. What is staggering is that you know, 10 to the 31 leaves open the possibility that once we have the world's Illumina and 454 machines devoted to this task, we're going to really get a sense of the diversity. Another sort of really important point is, you know, it's pretty clear that the bacteria that existed in the LUCA stage have not survived, but their genomes might have survived by virtue of the fact that they're being passed on. So again, I'm using these phage, I feel like the, the most beautiful thing that I've heard coming purely from a non-expert point of view, is that our means of reconstructing what actually organisms look like uh, in the sort of LUCA stage, our best insight might actually come from things like phage. So on that vein, I'll sort of point out that Jonathan Eisen and Craig Venter published a really beautiful study talking about completely new kingdoms of life based on these reg BCD uh, orthologs, which do not match either archaea or eubacteria. And they, they made the point that, you know, this probably is a sort of phage origin, but they sort of, what all the press releases were about the fourth kingdom of life. But I really do think that this, these, even if these are viral bones, they're really giving us insight into this kingdom of life. I will point out though that it's actually very hard to do the kinds of things that we do with paleovirology, with bacteria and phage, just because the rates of evolution are so high mm -hmm. that each episode overrides the previous one. And so there is a sweet spot to capture these uh, some of these uh, recent work on pleurococcus phages, including the CRISPR system, is a beautiful example of catching it in the act. But you come back even years later and, you know, you basically missed it. And there is a new arms race uh, undergoing. So I think there, there's something to be said for the deep view and there's something to be said for the shallow view and, and, and sort of reconstructing that there's an iterative arms race that's been going on for a long time. This is Stanley Malloy again. I'd like to come back to this viral fossil bits in the genome. So, so you mentioned the idea that some of them, a few examples, really look like they're playing some role. So we were talking about this on TWIM yesterday, how much of this stuff really is junk. And could you estimate a percentage just that you would think is, is still functional in some way of that total set of fossilized viruses. So I'm actually not going to differentiate now between viral fossils and retro element fossils. These are sort of endogenous retro elements that don't have an infectious life cycle, but just make imprints. You can actually calculate uh, what percent of the human genome is quote unquote useful, which means how much of it has been protected from mutational accumulation. So if you look purely at the protein coding set, that's about 1.2%. So we have you know, eight times more virus than actually human protein coding genes. But it turns out that if you were to simply look at parts of the genome that are protected from transposition or some sort of indels, that number is close to five to six percent. That probably is a very good estimate of stuff that we are currently finding useful enough that we preserve that. Now that's the total amount and that includes a lot of things like the stuff that I talked about. Syncytin doesn't fall into that category because we know that syncytin is now a bona fide human gene. So that's just the stuff like LTRs that sit upstream of other uh, human genes that have a useful expression pattern that we like them for. Uh, it turns out a lot of those 5% uh, differences are transcripts that are expressed in the brain and the testes. Uh, so whether that has any sort of meaning uh, or whether that's just simply transcriptional noise is unclear at the moment. But a lot of people would sort of fall bimodally on the uh, number, but the consensus view is about 90% of the genome uh, is probably not under constraint. Okay, that's great. Nice discussion. Um, we've read a few emails, and so what I'd like to do now is move to uh, one of our last parts of TWIV, and that is our picks of the week. Uh, 
and I'll start off and we'll see if our guests have anything. Uh, my, my pick today is a column or an article or blog post written by David Dobbs uh, at Neuron Culture. And the title is Free Science One Paper at a Time. This is a blog post about open access, basically uh, referencing uh, Jonathan Eisen's attempts to get his father's papers uh, accessible to everyone. It's a beautiful story, and it interweaves within it the story of publishing in science, which, as many of you know, is becoming more and more of a difficulty in getting everything that we publish open to everyone. So uh, that's an article by David Dobbs, Free Science, One Paper uh, at a Time. Uh, Harmit, do you have a pick for us? Well, now that you've sort of preempted me with the open science, I was going to pick a non-open science. But I think <laughs> in the spirit of open science, I'm actually going to uh, suggest uh, the uh, mouse knockout of Syncytin 2, which clearly demonstrated, by Terry Heidman and colleagues, demonstrated the functional consequence of a retro domesticated retroviral gene okay, in PNAS, I believe. Okay, thank you. Roger, do you want to recommend yeah, something? Um, so this, this is a, a paper that came out in Nature a few months ago, but I was reminded of it by a, a talk here. Uh, and that is uh, the structure of adenovirus virions uh, using cryo-electromicroscopy by Hong Zhu and his colleagues. Um, and this is, this is a real milestone because I mean, when I first started collaborating with people doing cryo-EM, the best resolution you could get was maybe 20 or 30 angstroms. And now the technology and the instruments have improved to the point that, that you can, as demonstrated by this adenovirus structure, you can get to good enough resolution that you can actually trace the chain of the protein and, and see where the side chains are. And I think it's going to revolutionize structural biology. And that was previously only possible with x-ray crystallography. Right. That's amazing. Yeah, in fact, there, there was, yeah. at the same time, uh, a group from uh, Southern California uh, published the structure of the same virus mm -hmm. done by crystallography, which was itself a, a major feat. And the two groups achieved about the same resolution. OK, the trio-EM structure of adenovirus. That is an amazing tour de force. We also have a listener pick of the week. This is sent in from Mark. Um, recurring themes on TWIV are public suspicion against vaccination, decline of infant vaccination, and broader societal effects. I recently heard TWIV 132, wherein you speculated that lack of direct or familial awareness of common preventable diseases is a factor leading to decline in vaccination. As a listener pick of the week, I nominate the site shotbyshot.org. It has videos, case studies from people talking about how lack of vaccination hurt family members, friends, or patients who contracted preventable diseases. Take a look. The videos are well done. Be forewarned, many of them are heartbreaking. How I discovered this, I recently reviewed my booster shot for tetanus. The administering nurse said that California has an epidemic of pertussis, a.k.a. whooping cough. I was given Tdap, a cocktail against tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Question about terminology. Is it correct to call a vaccination like this, or MMR, trivalent, or does the term trivalent instead refer to a medicine with three different vaccines in it against a single disease? I believe it can be both. Poliovirus is trivalent, and the three different bacterial vaccines is trivalent as well. I had long thought whooping cough is one of those diseases that scared your parents and which you never encounter because everyone got vaccinated for it in childhood. I was surprised that it was epidemic here in California. Reported cases have increased 100-fold in the past few years. This is not a California-only issue. There are epidemics in Michigan, Ohio, Florida, among other states. Interested listeners can check the CDC's MMWR report, and he gives us a link. Uh, table 2, you will find regional and state-level reporting. Via Google, I found that California's state legislator added personal belief as a reason for exemption from mandatory vaccination. Opinion and myth trump science. The only comment I will make on California's elected officials and their policy is that they mandate a higher level of care for my cocker spaniel via mandatory vaccinations against rabies and other disease than is required for school-aged children. Maybe this is why some call California the epicenter of the anti-vaccine movement. 
Keep up the good work with all three of your podcasts. Please, before launching another, invent the 25-hour day to help listeners find time for all your great content, Mark. So Mark is a friend of ours from a wonderful company called Drobo, who has sponsored TWIV in the past. Uh, that'll do it for another TWIV. There are many ways that you can listen to us. You can find us on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace. Uh, we also have an app uh, at microbeworld.org slash app with which you can stream the content to your iPhone or Android device, so check those out. You can always go to twiv.tv and play the episodes, download them, and also look at all of our show notes. As always, send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. And I'd like to thank everybody for participating today. Rachel Ketz and Ellenbogen, who has left us at the University of Washington. Harmit Malik is also up in the Seattle area at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. It was me. great. And Roger Hendricks is at the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I'm at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thank you.